Hello, my name is Darsha Narvaez. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Notre Dame, and I'm happy to be able to talk to you about meeting basic needs and getting kids on track to fulfill their potential. Here's an outline of the topics we'll discuss. First, our setting and the shifts that have gotten us where we are now. And what are appropriate baselines for who are human beings? What do they need to grow well? What does species, species normal, normative development look like? And what does species atypical development look like? And then we apply ideas to the ethical classroom. How do we meet ba students' basic needs through uh, our practices? And I present the um, model of RAVES. And then how do we get ourselves as human beings back on track? So here's the setting. We are in a big mess. And I'm focused on the United States because the United States uh, tends to broadcast and export its ways to the rest of the world. So what does it look like in the USA? Well, human well-being is on the decline. We've got rising cases of mental illness uh, in the last decades. Violence and suicide rates are up. People under age 50, and this is in 2013, are at a health disadvantage compared to the other advanced nations, 16 of them. U.S. lifespan has shrunk for the last few years. Child well-being tends to rank near the bottom of advanced nations as well. So humanity is not doing very well. But at the same time, Earth systems are breaking down. We have climate instability, global warming, melting of ice caps and glaciers, massive ecological disruption from human activity virtually everywhere on the planet. Our oceans are being emptied of fish and being filled with plastic. And we have really a biological annihilation going on. That means biodiversity um, going downhill. So just a recent report said that a million species will disappear in the next few years. So things are not good. What happened? How do we get here? Because there are a lot of humans that live sustainably for thousands of years. And yet we in a few hundred years are just, just making all this destruction occur at a rapid pace. What's wrong? Well, the idea of shifting baselines is one from oceanography, where they notice that people who, marine biologists, for example, thought that whatever the oceans were like when they were kids was normal. That's the normal rate or number of fish and health, etc. But actually, then, if you think only in one generation, you miss what's happening across generations. And that's what's happening here, I think, with human well being. We've shifted our child raising practices in a negative direction, number one there, which re, 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 um, re <laughs> turns out to affect our neurobiology in a negative way. And uh, number three, our adults and how they behave, how well they are, how moral they are, what kind of morality they have, and then the kind of culture, number four, that those adults foster and the narratives and stories they attend to. So we've shifted baselines in all these areas and they're all interrelated. And the hopeful thing is that we can intervene at any point in any of these, at any of these levels. But let's go into more detail. Where do we start? How do we address uh, the problems? Well, we have to under understand what our baselines are for those elements that I just mentioned. And I'm gonna focus in on are children, human children. What do children need for optimal development? Well, a lot of people think that animal needs for warmth and nourishment, shelter, protection, that's all you need to raise a baby. Uh, but they don't know, they forgot, they've been misraised themselves, and they forget that we are mammals and we need lots of affection, pretty much 24 seven in early life, and lots of play, interactive play with others. We're also social mammals, which means we need extensive bonding with more than mom, with several people, and we need community support throughout our lives in order to behave well, to feel connected, to have our basic needs met. We also are human beings and we need more than that even. We need to have intersubjectivity, that shared mind meld, that shared uh, understanding with multiple adults when we're children. 
And we need to be immersed in communal rituals, rituals that keep us calm, that keep us connected, that keep us um, in community. We need apprenticeship in adult activities, many years of observation and practice uh, so that we can actually become uh, cooperative adults. And we need stories or narratives that guide our behavior, that guide our imagination so we focus on the right things. Well, how do we meet those needs? How do we attend to our young children, especially needs, basic needs? Well, we have a nest like all animals. And our nest is particularly intensive because we are born so immature. We look like fetuses of other animals till we're 18 months of age. Imagine, till you're 18 months of age, you look like a fetus, you act like a fetus. So what kind of experience should you, should you have in those 18 months? Well, an external womb experience. And this is the kind of external womb that our species evolved to provide children. We call it the evolved nest. And this is the place where our stories about life begin because our subconscious mind is shaped by our experience in early life. How much to trust the world, how much to trust ourselves, how much to trust our relationships. And all those things are well established in a healthy direction when we provide the nest, which has these kinds of experiences that you can see, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next slide. So here we call the, the evolved nest, the other name, the more academic name, evolved developmental niche. And these characteristics are provided or provisioned by a community, not just by mom, not just my mom and dad, but by the community, the village. And Melvin Connor, an anthropologist, uh, anthropologist noted these practices all over the world in small men hunter gatherers. And they provide the same, these same experiences. And I talk about it as a cultural commons for developing human nature. Most of these practices are 30 to 40 million years old because they come from the social mammal line that we're part of. So first, soothing perinatal experiences, that means birth is calm. There's no stress or distress imposed on the child. So they're not separated from mom and baby, no painful procedures. Touch, lots of affectionate touch, pretty much held or kept near others pretty constantly. Responsiveness, responsivity. This means a prompt response to the needs of the child, the baby, to keep them calm, to keep them in optimal arousal so that when they're growing so quickly after birth, they grow well. And you need a good biochemistry in order to grow well. If you're chemically in distress, you're not going to grow. You're going to shut down. You're going to just try to stay alive if you're distressed. <coughs> breastfeeding is another one. This uh, We're called mammals because of our breastfeeding. Our babies are nursed frequently, two to three times an hour initially, because our milk is thin and needs to be ingested frequently to wash the body and brain with the right chemicals, biochemical, again, a bath. And this lasts for two to five years. The average age of weaning is four years old. Oh my God, you say, oh, can that be? I can't, oh, I can't imagine it. Well, it's because the breast milk has thousands of ingredients, including the immunoglobulins to build the immune system. And it takes about that long for it to reach adult levels. So these are built into our species needs, basic needs. Allo parents or allo mothers, these are other mothers, other caregivers beyond mom that also hold the baby, respond to the baby, play with the baby. They're typically fathers and grandmothers, but they can be other people too, even non-kin. Play is another one. This is free play. And babies are ready to play from birth. They're ready to have back and forth so-called conversations uh, with the caregivers so that their brain is actually being socially constructed. Uh, and this play occurs in the natural world. So that means out in nature. So you get a sense of feeling connected and safe in your natural setting and with multiple age playmates, not the same age playmates. Because young people, young children, love to learn from the older, and the older love to guide the younger. And so that happens in these multi-age playgroups. 
and doesn't really much happen with the same age because you don't, can't learn a lot from your mates except to take risks and be competitive. Finally, social support, positive climate. This means that mom and baby feel like they're supported. They feel like the community is behind their well-being and they can relax into that support. All these features, I could talk about all the neurobiology of each one of these, we know now have neurobiological effects on how well the brain builds itself. Uh, and when these are missing, we can see a more stressed brain, not as well developed, not as intelligent, not as self-regulated in all sorts of layers of ways. So early body brain mind development is happening very rapidly. Uh, thousands of synapses a second, if not more. Babies are, as I said, are highly mature at birth, 18 months early. Only 25% of the brain, adult size brain volume is there at full term birth. And so they need this exterogestation, an external womb. And you can't really, you think, oh, nature or nurture. Well, it's not really a question of nature or nurture. It's always both. At every, any given moment, there's always an interaction. The baby now is a different baby than five minutes ago. And so that's a different nature uh, and the nurture they receive. Is it appropriate? Is it the evolved nest, which then supports good development or is it some other stressful situation? So there's a constant interaction that promotes various epigenetic effects. That means turning on or off genes that are scheduled to being turned on or off at that time point and a very plastic dynamic system. So that early experience shapes the trajectory for where that baby's gonna go in terms of health and well-being, sociality and morality. So if a baby is highly stressed in early life, that means left to cry, left alone. These are very distressful things for a social mammal. That means the dynamic system is going to move in a suboptimal direction and it's really hard to get out of that later because so many things are developing so quickly in those early months and years that the sensitive period passes and you almost cannot fix anything. Um, some things you can fix, but later with good healing practices, but other things you can't. And we don't know exactly which because we can't do these kinds of experiments to find out. And so there's a biosocial construction of who we are our emotions and cognition grow together. That means they are shaped by our experience and our experience then is shaping our sense of self, our implicit self, that subconscious sense of self. Am I good? Am I bad? Am I loved? Am I unlovable? Uh, and undergirds our social and moral capacities later. A lot of this stuff happens in our unconscious mind because we don't learn to verbalize things till age two, three, and all, but there's tons of learning that happens before then. And another thing is our social worldview. Do we think the world is a safe place, benevolent, or is it a dangerous, scary place that we always have to be on the watch for um, threats? So as I said, emotion and cognition are built together. So these structures, our cognitive structures, emerge from the recurrent patterns of sensory motor activity, the recurrent patterns of what that baby feels and what they experience. Are they with others? Are they in social interaction with others? Then they build a good multi-layers of skills to get along with others. And these are shaped in the subcortical systems and the neocortical, different parts of the brain um, that are growing at different times and interrelating and connecting. And the emotional circuitry then that's established in early life, we're built, we have some built-in emotion systems, uh, but they have to be tuned up in one way or another. And this is, these are going to be related then to our social, moral, and ethical expression. So a brain, a body, child who is stressed a lot in early life isn't going to build the kind of circuitry that leads to cooperative sociality, but instead is going to lead to stress reactivity shifting. Uh, so when the stress response kicks in, as you may have noticed in yourself, you can't think very well and you're not going to be open minded or open hearted because your blood flow has shifted to your muscles for you to escape, right? And if you can't escape, then you start to shut down. So it's flight fight, freeze, or faint. So different systems of the body try to protect you from dying. Uh, and there's just different layers of how, um, whether you can 
save yourself or not, you go into different modes. So if you've been stressed a lot as a baby, you're going to have a hard time learning. You're going to have a hard time being open and friendly with others. You're going to be more focused on your own protection. Jean Leadloff, uh, an accidental anthropologist, wrote this wonderful book. I encourage you to read The Continuum Concept. You can also find it online. There's a website with lots of information that people have put together. And she says, the feeling appropriate to an infant in arms is his feeling of rightness or essential goodness, the premise that he's good, right, and welcome. Without that conviction, a human being of any age is crippled by a lack of confidence, a full sense of self, of spontaneity, of grace. You can see that a lot of children come to school now and they don't have this feeling, they don't have that conviction of rightness or essential goodness. They have a primal wound. And so this is our normal species, typical way of growing humanity that is found all over the world in our ancestral context of small band hunter-gatherer communities. They represent 99% of our history as a genus. And now in the industrialized world, we've decided, no, the babies don't need that. They need to be independent and trained like a machine. So. A lot of us have had primal wounds in our lives, and we are crippled to some degree or another with the lack of self-confidence, uh, spontaneity, and grace that she's referring to that she noted with the Aquana Indians, among others, in, in the Amazon. And this is what you can see in societies that provide the nest. And what the babies there experience then is lots of social pleasure. They have the presence of others, the reverence that they are revered for their being alive, for being maybe a, an ancestor reincarnated. I mean, you never know, or a god. I mean, there's a high value of babies and children. And they experience intersubjectivity, that shared mental mind, um, emotion, um, communication, uh, pathway with others. They experience empathy for mothers who meet their needs without complaint, without uh, resistance. And they practice perspective taking, uh, growing into greater and greater skills there. And all this leads to social pleasure, love to be with others, and a sense of social effectiveness or effectivity, ability to be with others, and deep empathic roots. They feel very um, uh, empathically connected to the others in their community but also to the natural world, which I'll mention later. And so this is our human nature well-developed. And so the neurobiology of the child is shaped accordingly from the bottom up here. Core self feels competent. I am competent. I can trust others, self, in the world. And then as action capacities increase, the child feels that sociality is easy and fun and I empathize with others. And then with greater development, the communal self, a sense of being connected, uh, the emotions, the cognitions or thoughts, feelings, inclinations, all are coordinated together holistically and integrated. Whereas you can see that the opposite happens typically, I think, in the United States with children. From the bottom up, I don't trust myself. I don't trust others. I don't trust the world. I'm not, I don't feel competent. I don't empathize. Empathy is going down in the United States. Social experience is not easy or fun. I'd rather sit with my, my iPhone. And the communal self is disorganized and dysregulated. So I, I want that chocolate cake. No, you can't have the chocolate cake. Or, you know, I hate that person. No, you get it. And so there's everything's discoordinated. You have inclinations for one thing and you're told to do something else and you don't even know what you really want. It's cake is not really what you really want. You want to be a, yourself, but you can't find yourself anymore. So anyway, things get all kind of disordered, dysregulated, off track. But with good care, we'll come back to, I'm going to talk about bad care later again, but here's the good care. So notice these three systems here. These are, Paul McLean identified three kind of major mindsets that, that we can go into, global mindsets. And the survival systems there are what we're born with. And they can be um, ratcheted up or ratcheted down, depending on which one, what happens to you in early life. Um, 
And there's the mammalian emotion systems. These have to be cultivated after birth. They're, they're ready to go, but they have to be uh, socialized. And then the third system comes later. It develops till about age 30 now, we think, uh, where our abstraction and capacities develop, our ability to be uh, thinking outside the present moment, our imagination, and uh, our ability to control ourselves, executive functions, and so on. So in a good, well-functioning brain, this is what it looks like. The executive functions grow into a way that they control those survival systems. So if suddenly you go into panic for maybe you see a shadow and you think, oh my god, there's someone after me, and you go into a panic, uh, but then you realize that was just a shadow, your, your executive functions are able to immediately calm yourself down. It doesn't uh, reverberate or anything. Um, whereas in a malfunctioning brain, it would take a long time to recover. And then notice you spend most of your time in this, what I call, heart-centered imagination. So the ability to um, focus in on playing and caring for others, being present emotionally in the present moment, uh, and using your imagination, your ideas, your thoughts about possibilities in a way that's very much empathically grounded in the way I mentioned earlier. You have great em empathy roots. And so we have our species typical mindsets that we can see in the small band hunter gatherer communities around the world, these two. I call one the engagement ethic, that's the full emotional presence in the moment with the other person. You're able to practice intersubjectivity and resonate with the other and do the interpersonal dance in an egalitarian way, treat them with reverence. Your, um, these things are developed and primed in, in the ways I mentioned with the nest, fostering secure attachment through companionship care. And then when you're, when you're able to use your imagination to think about possibilities, you do so in a way that's egalitarian, responsible, sympathetic, and your sense of agency of how you want to act is connected to your communal connections. <coughs> Excuse me. So our nest that we have is a species typical developmental system. So this is the evolved expected support that's provided to the young. <coughs> and when that happens, you we should expect a species typical outcome, a smart, effective creature. And so that's what I've been talking about. What's a species typical outcome? So what we see around the world, outside of industrialized societies. And that kind of early experience looks like this in many ways. Lots of caring, touching, holding, responsiveness, closeness. And it would be beyond just one person, of course, beyond the mother, with father, grandmother, and others. But what happens when you move to societies that treat their young like this? Lots of isolation, not much touching. Even when there is touching with the father there, they're not looking into the eyes of the baby, which is really critical for brain development. And they're feeding their baby like their car, filling the gas tank, right? So what happens when... <coughs> You move from the species typical kind of upbringing to the species atypical developmental system. Well, <clears throat> we shouldn't be surprised that you're going to have a species atypical outcome. What's that mean? It means you're going to have individuals that are outside the evolved range of intelligence and effectiveness. And so that's what I say is happening in the United States and being exported around the world with globalization and enforced. Um, <clears throat> and force practices of globalization. What happens to a baby physiologically then when those needs are not met, when the evolved nest is degraded? Well, I like this picture because it shows a normal brain on the left, that fat part of the image is a neuron, and then all those little lines are connections they have to other neurons. And what develops in early life, especially, is the, are those connections. To other neurons. So we're born with lots of neurons, but all those synapses have to happen after birth. <clears throat> and then on the right side, you see that the neuron doesn't have a lot as many connections. That's what happens with distress, 
high cortisol levels in the brain melt synapses, and uh, depression is related to this kind of a brain on the right. So early experience sets up the structure and function of our physiology, our stress response, our immune system, all sorts of systems are dependent on good care to develop well. In the picture there on the right, <coughs> you can see on the left side a normal uh, slice of a three-year-old's brain, a normal three-year-old, and on the right side, three-year-old that's been extremely neglected, meaning they didn't get touched very much, they didn't get breastfed, they didn't get um, responded to appropriately, and felt you know just isolated and alone. They don't grow well in that kind of distressing situation. So what happens to our brain function then with our uh, early neglect or undercare? I call it undercare when we don't have the nest. Well, instead of this kind of brain working well, you're going to have toxic stress. Early toxic stress is going to lead to a self-protection disposition, meaning it enhances these survival systems. They get easily triggered, and this kind of stress reactivity then controls higher-order thinking. And, and shapes what attracts your attention. So if a bear moved into the room right now, you would be looking around for something to protect yourself with. In a toxically stressed brain early, up, early on, you're going to spend your, most of your time in that kind of mode. You're looking for threats, and you're looking around for safety. And the <clears throat> mammalian part of the brain, what I'm calling mammalian here, a sociality, or development our, of our care and love for others, our playfulness, is not developed well. And so that's, that's what leads you know, to most of our humanity. And that part is undermined and suppressed or neglected or absent. And your imagination is also going to be affected. So your imagination, those higher order thinking capacities, are going to be impaired with the emotion distortion, your stress reactivity, your sense of deep separation and distrust. And you're going to be susceptible to the dangerous ideas that Idelson and Idelson pointed out. A sense of superiority, because you have to be one up to be good, right? One down is not good. So you have to feel superior. You're going to feel distrusting. You're going to feel vulnerable, and you feel like uh, an, an injustice. You feel a deep sense of injustice because, of course, you didn't get your needs met. And you feel helpless because you don't have all the skills you need to, to uh, live well. And then you go, you have two basic types of self-protective imagination on the next page. Vicious imagination, this is where you want to control others. You have a deep sense of distrust and want to dominate others in one way or another showing how smart you are, for example. And you're going to be unegalitarian because you don't know any, anything else. And the other option is the more detached, emotionally disconnected way of being, fostering your intellect, which unfortunately is what we emphasize in school most of the time. So it promotes a lack of attuned relationship to the other. It's emotionally cool or cold. You don't want to feel, you feel anything. Yeah, don't feel your feelings. Students, don't look out the window and like the bird out there, the tree. Don't think about that. Focus here inside in the classroom on categorizing things, right? Then you end up stereotyping because you don't know any better. You haven't had enough life experience with real, real life experience to know that every situation is unique. It's not stereotypical. 
And you learn to objectify and dissect and order things, decontextualize everything. So you take it away from its own relationships and consequences of whatever it is you're studying. And you want to control and have power over objects like firm answers uh, and calculate utility of people and things. You want to exploit everything and innovate without a sense of consequence because you don't have those deep empathy roots. And so this is what we emphasize. This is what we think is cool. We think it's smart now in the, in the United States, in the uh, Western mindset. In everywhere else, they know this is a very dangerous place to be. This detached imagination is very dangerous because of how much harm it can do when you're detached emotionally, when you're detached relationally to where you are. You can manipulate and be a bureaucrat, technocrat, and do all sorts of damage, which of course we've done. So what's happened then is we've ignored our multiple inheritances, which includes the nest, the evolved nest. And throughout life now, we stress children, especially early on, uh, and put them on trajectories that are suboptimal. And with every, of, every one of these components of the nest and uh, basic needs unmet, every one missing is a risk factor that can lead to a self-focused personality as you develop instead of the other inclusive personality, which is what happens in our species normal trajectory. So what happens now, is, <clears throat> well, there's two ways here. This is neuroception. So in each situation, you come, come to that situation and you decide whether you feel uh, safe or not safe. So on the left side is the safe feeling uh, you see at the bottom. <clears throat> and when you feel safe, you'll approach whatever it is that is. You'll relax. You'll attune to whatever that situation is. You'll read social uh, uh, communications easily. You'll make meaning socially. Uh, and on the right side, you see they're unsafe. Uh, if you come to a situation you feel unsafe, you're going to feel mobilized for fight or flight or immobilized if that's not going to work, you freeze or faint, and you hide yourself. So you go into a safety mode. Now these things can, can happen bottom up as you move from situation to situation. But they can also happen top down. That's the top of the diagram. So if you have a story that tells you that green people are dangerous, then that top down belief is going to push you over into the safety uh, side when you see a green person. <clears throat> and so you uh, alleviate your stress by using your script or your stereotype to reassure yourself how superior you are and how right you are. And that actually alleviates some of your distress. So the safety mode <clears throat> is all about self-regulation and feeling uh, self-protected. The other side is more flexible, untuned, the engagement side, and takes lots of skill and lots of experience to, that, to be on that side. What do we do now? We've got a lot of kids that are coming in with the defensive modes. They are not well. They have not been well cared for, and in part because their parents are told they're not supposed to pay attention to babies' needs very much, let them cry, etc., or because their parents have been so distressed um, at the time of the child's raising, or their parents were also neglected, and so they don't have any sense of how to raise a baby well or what the evolved nest requires. It requires yielding to the needs of the baby. So now what do we do? We've got classrooms filled with students who have been undercared for. <clears throat> so we want to then deal with each of these minds. So if the proto-reptilian or the survival system minds are in charge of that child, they need to learn self-calming. And we need to, probably all of us need to practice self-calming. That means deep breathing, that means visualization of calming uh, scenarios, being out in the natural world in calm ways, and many other things. And we also then have to grow that sociality, our sense of playful, caring relationships. We have to have social experiences in groups for that. So I use folk song games, uh, you know, like the Farmer in the Dell, but games that are better than that with my undergraduates. And then we play with kindergartners. And they cannot believe how much fun that is. And of course, kindergartners are all into it. Uh, and so there's ways to build, rebuild the brain there with this, these kinds of experiences. 
And then for our imaginations, we need to build communal imagination to always be talking to our students about how we're connected to the community, we're connected, and the, the community cares about us, and to always emphasize relational connection. So we need to rebuild our human capacities. And the ways to do that then are to avoid those survival rooted imaginations. So avoid using language that says, oh, those people, oh, we're better than them. Uh, or, you know, who's going to be the winner today? All those things give the wrong idea. You want to have a relational talk be about us, us and us, not us and them. And you want to always think about the consequences of whatever you're doing. So not detach from consequences, not detached from relationships, not detached from emotions. You want to feel fully your emotions and train them well, which is what happens in our species typical nest. And you want to always be aware of what your actions uh, can possibly do to others and to the world. You want to develop the right hemisphere. We'll come back to this. The ability to be present in the present moment emotionally without feeling afraid or thinking about other things and to be, of course, aware of those interconnections and using play to do this, which we'll come back to in a moment too, <clears throat> and promote ecological communal imagination, the ongoing positive so social support we all need, a sense of embeddedness in nature and ecological attachment. Many people say now that part of our reason for destroying the planet is because people don't feel connected to nature. They feel like it's a dominant submission relationship and they can destroy and use it as they will rather than treating it as a relational egalitarian in a relational egalitarian way as sustainable societies have always done. So what does the classroom look like then? <clears throat> the sustaining healing classroom is going to promote that self-calming, deep breathing, mindfulness, meditation of various kinds, other practices, you can find all sorts of them. They're going to, it's going to promote social pleasure, physical play with peers, silly humor, social dance, song and art, cooperative learning in enjoyable ways, helping students develop those skills <coughs> and communal imagination, feeling a sense of us. Oh, we are really a good group. We're such good citizens, aren't we? And us and us. And how do we fit with our city? How do we help uh, the classroom across the hall or the school or we're in this together kind of language. And as I said, ecological attachment, which we'll come to again later. Hmm. So the ethical classroom, we've developed a model with uh, Minnesota teachers and it's, so there's materials online for this uh, that um, your professor can tell you about. So we developed this model and it's called RAVES. And this is how children grow into morally agile adults. R for relationships, A for apprenticeship, V for virtuous models, E for ethical skills, S for self-authorship. So let's go through it. First, the teacher, the educator, must establish a caring, responsive relationship with each child in the classroom. You know, this is kind of hard when you have hundreds of students in high school but certainly you can do various things that help them feel like they, that you care about them, such as greeting them at the door in the way they like, uh, for example. But what a caring, responsive relationship looks like is that it engages the emotions. It's not just about intellect. It's not just about thinking and training, uh, learning facts, but it's actually engaging your emotions. What does that child care about? And how do we help that child develop their emotions well? It fosters a, a secure attachment. Secure attachment means that the child can feel uh, that, tr that you are trustworthy, that you care about them, that you're not going to betray them. Builds, this builds a bridge for instruction. Secures the child's attention and establishes a line of influence. If they don't feel securely attached to the teacher, then you may never reach that child. Depends. And then a physiological orientation towards relational attunement. So letting the student learn <coughs> the physiology of connection if they haven't learned it, which is a sense of calmness in relationships. So holding hands uh, in circles can help. 
if someone's calm, they, their calmness can be transferred via the hand uh, to the other person. And so there's different things to do, and each teacher will do them differently. Um, and it may take longer with some students to develop these relationships. <clears throat> and then beyond the individual teacher to student relationship, we need to have a social climate in the classroom that's also supportive. So you want to keep members calm, help them learn to get along, so to learn face-to-face -face relational engagement, encouraging pro-social imagination, how can we do this to help others, how can we uh, <clears throat> think of new ways to help others, individual positive purpose, uh, enhancing your own uh, human potential for the good of the community, and then meeting basic needs which have been identified by others um, important for thriving and flourishing and human beings belonging in the sense that you belong to the group, the, that you're welcome, accepted, you have an effect. Autonomy, that you have choices to make, that you are not coerced into your behaviors. Self-enhancement, that you can <coughs> grow yourself in ways that you want to. Trust, that you trust that the, the community is a safe place to be and that you can make meaning, meaningful information, meaningful stories, meaningful um, patterns of understanding. Next is apprenticeship. How do people learn naturally? This is the way. And what does it mean? It means modeling by someone who's more expert. The, this person, like you, the teacher, thinks aloud while solving problems. Coaches the student on solving problems. Explains at, as the same, at the same time as authentic experience while they're doing things to explain the reasoning, the meaning. And then the student practices extensively, focused, practice guided by the coach. This is how apprenticeship works. This is how students best learn. So it's a combination of immersed, embodied practice with intellectual guidance um, by the teacher or the mentor. V for virtuous village. Virtuous village refers to adults who demonstrate generosity, respect, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, humility, and courage. These are were commonplace in the elders of the past. And what what students need is are for this are multiple examples. They need to be immersed in what that looks like. What does generosity look like? How does it manifest itself in this situation? And they need time to practice, opportunities to practice, to imitate. And it has to be extensive again. The virtuous village provides a positive social climate. That means in within the family, within the classroom, there are more positive than negative emotions that are felt and expressed. There's more joy, serenity, or expansiveness and less about sadness, anger, and fear, humiliation. So of course there's emotion there, but it's the p more of the positive emotions. But when sadness or anger or fear or humiliation come up, they're dealt with properly. And in our studies, we find that adults report more of these positive emotions in childhood are more securely attached, mentally healthier, less distressed, and less likely to go into that self-protective mode of getting along with others or morality. In a positive social climate, the individual feels loved, cherished, appreciated, and is able to create positive reactions in others and has deep friendship with at least one other person. So that's the kind of schools we want to, to foster, if not classrooms. Our human heritage is to spend a lot of time in social play, and this is a healing experience. So as much as possible to have as much social play within the classroom or school setting is great. So this means an ongoing social engagement of singing together, dancing together, laughing and teasing, telling jokes and stories, and relaxing in various ways. And physiologically, of course, this is gonna uh, boost oxytocin, prolactin, serotonin, and all the relaxing hormones that keep us tuned in and really in a moral mood, a social moral mood. And finally, the virtuous uh, elders and the virtuous village provide stories as well as safety and support. The adults tell us their stories about their own development. 
they tell us that they, they understand that their own characters are always under construction. And they tell us about their failures and their successes. And they show us by the activities they pursue and by how use they, they use their imaginations about how their character is constructed. Stories shape what we believe about ourselves and the world. They guide our actions. And children learn whom they can or should become from the stories we tell them. So in babyhood, it's by the way we treat them. They learn whether they're lovable or unlovable, whether the world is safe or not. And then later in school, the stories we tell them also gives them notions and give them pathways to become more of themselves, more human. They internalize these stories by how we treat them as well. E for ethical skills. This is a toolbox we've created, lots of materials online and in books. Uh, these are the ethical skills that a classroom can embed in regular instruction. Ethical sensitivity, judgment, focus, and action. self-authorship. In this case, uh, to be a virtuous individual, to be a well-functioning person, you have to be autonomous enough to monitor your own choices. And young people can't do this. They need mentors. They need mentors for a long, long time. Aristotle, a well-known philosopher, said it's about age 30 when you can start mentoring yourself. <laughs> but before then, we all need help. And then once developed, they must be maintained. These virtues must be maintained by how we, what friends we select, what, what activities we select, what environments we put ourselves into. So that's what we learn after age 30, uh, hopefully with a lot of help before then. <clears throat> but before then, the adults, the mentors, have to help students, have to help young people select friends, activities, and environments because their brain isn't fully developed. They don't have enough life experience either. And so self-authorship, I've mentioned the right brain hemisphere, um, which again is going to come up again in the next slide. But the right brain is what's supposed to have developed in early life. And it's the seed of all sorts of good things, which we'll see in a moment. And the way to build it is to build self-awareness. So a lot of students have lost that pathway to understanding themselves. And there are ways to help them bring it back through journaling paying attention to what they like and dislike instead of what everyone else likes, doing things that bring joy to them, including art, music, and play. So the right hemisphere, along with prefrontal cortex functions, have a great deal to do with our self-regulation capacities. So the ability to control our emotions, control our behavior, control our social reactions. They also, it also has a lot to do with intersubjectivity and the ability to feel social pleasure, our emotional intelligence and empathy and our sense of being and connected, our ability to be self-transcendent, to reach higher consciousness and to be receptive and intelligent. A lot of these things are right hemisphere directed, although the whole brain always works together. And you can see in the image, <coughs> <laughs> the right brain is where all the fun is, and the left brain, which is what we emphasize in school, is sort of the drudgery of focusing in on one thing at a time, linear fashion, categorizing, and dissecting, and decontextualizing. So ethical character development can occur through raves, through relationships within the classroom. Well, first with teacher to student, then classroom relationships, and then to the wider community. Apprenticeship through modeling, guidance, and practice. Virtuous models through immersion and through story. Ethical skills of sensitivity, judgment, focus, and action. And self-authorship. Raves and our development as human beings, as moral, social, highly ethical people. The purpose of all this is to live in a good life in the community. And so we each live within an ecological context that hopefully is supporting our full capacities and the whole community hopefully is building ethical skills together. That's what we should aim for. <clears throat> now, 
Let me just show you three tracks here. The middle track, I think, is what we've been emphasizing mostly in, in the United States, the species typical outcome where we think that which we think cooperation, communalism, receptive intelligence, wisdom, relational attunement, responsibility. This is very focused on our <coughs> on humanity. And then if you look at that orange, hopefully it's orange for you, the trauma, when trauma occurs, uh, it will push you down into the self-protectionist frame which is also with the degraded nest, extremely degraded nest, will push you into this op oppositionalism, egocentrism, detached imagination. Now, our full species typical trajectory, though, is at the top, where we're immersed in nature, when in adolescence we have a vision quest that connects us to the universe, and we feel relationally attuned with the natural world. And this is our original species typical outcome of cooperation and communalism that is all inclusive of nature and our bonding to nature. So this is really what we should be aiming for beyond just a human <coughs> anthropocentric kind of based morality. We need to have a nature or ecocentric morality. So our heritage is this, to have companionship caregiving, number one there, that builds a good physio neurosocial biology, which leads to adults with well-being and wisdom and they foster communities that attend to the basic needs that provide that companionship caregiving. But we also have to remember that <clears throat> in our sustainable communities around the world, they also do this within a relational connection to the earth, to their local landscape. So just to get you thinking about that a little more, think of a favorite place in the natural world, a place where you feel serene and connected to the larger, perhaps, universe, or at least that place, the Earth, on the Earth. And let yourself feel those heart feelings of connection. Feel it from the heart center and bonding out to that place and feel the energy sharing you have with that place. <coughs> and then now take that energy that feeling of peace, that feeling of joy, the joy connection. Expand it to your whole body. Expand it to a circle, a bubble around you. <coughs> and imagine sharing that with your students, with your friends, with your family, that sense of bondedness to the earth. We want to build this kind of ecological attachment, uh, earth-based wisdom. Aldo Leopold, who started out as a not in this orientation, but came to it from his experiences in the natural world, he said, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So this is ecological wisdom. This is ethical ecological wisdom. I think we need to return to if we're going to save our species and turn things around. And our stories matter. David Corton noted that we are dominated by the story of sacred money and markets right now. <coughs> and we need to return it to, as most societies have, uh, in the past at least, to the sacred life and living earth story. To understand that we are connected, we are part of the earth, we are responsible to be respectful of earth systems, of earth, of the more than human um, that keep us alive. We depend on the earth. The earth does not depend on us. So our heritage we can return to, a cycle of cooperative companionship. And it starts at every level, <coughs> including the classroom. There are books that we've written among with other papers too, and lots of things that emphasize that basic needs in early life and how they impact adulthood. And for more information, please look up these locations. Evolve Nest, evolvenest.org is a new website. We have a lot of information, but there's lots of things, downloadable papers, academic papers and things. And then I have a blog, Psychology Today, Moral Landscapes.
where I read a lot about parenting and morality. And thank you very much.